Nir Eyal, welcome to the Development by David podcast. How are you really, my friend? Doing well, David. Thanks so much for having me. You know, it's such a real, like, real privilege to have you on here. You're one of the most coveted minds in the world of productivity. I've heard you and enjoyed you on so many different podcasts, um, such huge stages such as uh, Chris Williamson's Modern Wisdom, Stephen Bartlett's Diary of the CEO, but even closer to home, my friend Colin Campbell's Canberra Conversations podcast. Colin's a great friend of mine, and I'm really proud that you made this introduction. So thank you for stopping by today, Oh, sure thing. Happy to. For those who are unfortunately not familiar with your work yet, how would you bring Nir Eyal to life in 2022? Well, uh, I'll start by introducing myself as a behavioral designer. So I help companies build the kind of products and services that form healthy habits in users' lives. So all kinds of products from healthcare products to help people uh, adhere to a, a medication routine or to use their asthma inhaler out of a habit, for example, uh, to working with educational startups to get people hooked to learning a new language, for example, uh, to all, all kinds of products and services that rely upon habitual action. So that's kind of my, uh, my professional endeavors have to do with helping people build healthy habits in the products and services we use. And then uh, I also work with individuals. My second book is called Indistractable, How to Control Your Attention and Choose Your Life. And that book is all about how to break the bad habits because I really think we can have our cake and eat it too. We can build good habits with products that we use, but we can also learn how to break the bad habits that keep us from living the life we want. I cannot wait to dive deeper into both of your books. But before we do that, the premise of this podcast follows a guest story from Genesis to where they're at now. Before you wrote both your earth-shattering books, what did life look like before then, Nir? Let's see, before I was an author, uh, I was an entrepreneur. I started a couple of tech companies and uh, both of them were acquired. And uh, the first one was in the gaming and advertising uh, industry. And I, I had this front row seat uh, to learn about how companies change our behavior through the products and services they build. And so my idea was, well, what if we could take the same psychology that makes products like Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and WhatsApp and Slack and Snapchat so habit-forming and sticky, what if we could use that exact same psychology for good? What if we could steal their secrets so that entrepreneurs uh, in all kinds of industries could use those same tactics for good? So that's what I did directly before becoming an author. Um, and then uh, I also taught at the Stanford Graduate School of Business, and later at the Hassel Platter Institute of Design. Um, well before I started companies, what was I doing? I was a consultant, uh, and then before that I was uh, in, in college. And then way back when, I think my, my fascination with this entire field of behavioral design probably started when I was a very fat child. So I used to be clinically obese as a kid. Uh, I remember my mom took me to the doctor and he showed me this chart that said, okay, here's your weight. Uh, you know, th this would be the range for normal weight, this would be the range for overweight, and here you are way over here, you're obese. And I think um, that's probably where my fascination with uh, how products change behavior began, because uh, I remember feeling for a good chunk of my, of my life, uh, from childhood up until early adulthood, that food controlled me. And I really wanted to understand why that was. Not only that, I could see how products in general seem to have an effect on, on people, right? I remember like uh, um, being obsessed with collecting basketball cards. I don't know if you were ever in, had that phase, but like I, I love basketball care. I, I guess today people are into like, I don't know, Pokemon or whatever, but at my, in my day it was garbage pail kids and, and, and basketball cards. And there was like this obsessive like collecting need. Um, and so I remember being really fascinated, like why, why do I do that? <laughs> like why am I wasting all my money on this stuff? Um, and then I remember, you know, food definitely had that same impact of I would know something wasn't good for me. And yet I found that it was, it, it seemed like it controlled me. And so I, I, you know, kind of became fascinated with, with that. And I think that carries over very much to today where it seems like our technology is, is changing our behavior as well. So you're telling me it's not just technology and social media that causes great distraction here? Right. Yeah, I think that's kind of the uh, the, the knee-jerk reaction is always to blame the thing, right? It's uh, to blame the thing that you are buying or the thing that is uh, appears to distract you. That whatever's in your hand in that moment is what you blame. But it's a very um, simplistic 
uh, explanation, right? That uh, a lack of nuance is a symptom of a simplistic mind. Uh, and I think that was my initial reaction uh, when, you know, a few years ago, I found myself getting distracted by technology. My first reaction was to blame the technology, right? I, uh, so what, what did I do? I, I read these books on, you know, why it's all technology's fault, and I had to figure out how to how to get the technology out of my life, right? Digital minimalism or whatever it is, uh, digital detoxes or whatever they call it. So I, I got rid of I got rid of it. I, uh, I I got rid of my smartphone and I got one of those flip phones, uh, you know, the kind we used to use in the '90s with no internet connection, no apps. I got myself a word processor uh, with no internet connection, and I thought, okay, now I'm gonna finally stay focused. I'm finally gonna be able to write. Uh, and I would, I would start, you know, get, I, I plan to get to work on this word processor, no internet connection, no apps, no social media. And I still got distracted. Why? Because even when I sat down to write without any of these new technologies like the internet, like social media, like all these apps, I would say, hey, you know, there's, there's that book on the shelf that I've been meaning to, to read into. Or, or, or look, look at my desk. I, I think I need to organize my desk. It's so messy. Or let me just take out the trash real quick. And I kept getting distracted. And the more I, I, I got into the psychology of distraction, I learned that the actual cause of distraction is much more interesting and much more actionable than just blaming our technology. That we want to blame the things outside of us, right? We want to blame the food for making us fat. We want to blame the technology for distracting us. We want to blame these things outside of us. But it turns out that Really, the, the real source of most of our distraction, we can get into why this is, is that most distraction begins from within. That distraction is always a desire to escape an uncomfortable sensation. It's always about escaping an uncomfortable sensation. So fundamentally, the kryptonite of distraction, I don't care how persuasive uh, you know, the, the, the technology might be, I don't care how delicious the chips might be, whatever it is, at the end of the day, it's about managing our discomfort. That one of the biggest revelations I had researching the psychology of, this, uh, of distraction in, in the five years it took me to write this book is that time management is pain management. I would go further and say money management is pain management. <laughs> Weight management is pain management. It's really about how we manage discomfort. So distraction, it's not a moral failing. Uh, it's not that you have some kind of something, something's broken with you. I mean, okay, some, about 3% of the population has ADHD, has an actual you know, diagnosis, but 97% chance that's not you, right? The amount of people who think that there's something wrong with them uh, is way higher than people who actually have some kind of pathology. Most, the vast majority of us do not have a pathology. Now there's special steps you can take if you have ADHD, but for the vast majority of us, there's nothing wrong with us. We don't need a diagnosis. We, we, we just need to learn how to become indistractable. And it turns out the vast majority of us don't learn. Uh, we, we just think we are supposed to pick it up along the way. But this is going to become the skill of the century, that there will be a bifurcation between people who let their time and attention and their minds and their life be controlled by others and people who stand up and say, no, I will decide how I control my time, attention, my mind, and my life because I am indistractable. So fascinating. You want, you know, one of the, the quotes that stood out was time management is pain management. And one of my favorite lines from your book is we can't call something a distraction unless we know what it's distracting you from. Right. I know from my own habits that I do things that feel like work that aren't the meaningful work, but because they're work emails or podcast research when I should be doing a completely other t different task, it feels like work and it doesn't feel like a distraction. How can we distinguish the meaningful work from the meaningless work? It's a, it's a great question. So the first place to start is with the definition of distraction. What, what are we talking about when we use this word distraction? Well, the best way to understand what that term means is to understand what it doesn't mean. What is the opposite of distraction? Most people, if you ask them what's the opposite of distraction, they'll tell you the opposite of distraction is focus. But that's not right. The opposite of distraction is not focus. The opposite of distraction is traction. Okay, We have traction and we have dis traction. Both words come from the same Latin root, trahare, which means to pull. Okay, And they both end in the same six letters, A-C-T-I-O-N, that spells action. So traction, by definition, is any action that 
pulls you towards what you say you're going to do, things that you do with intent, things that move you closer to your values and help you become the kind of person you want to become. Those are acts of traction. The opposite of traction is distraction. Distraction is any action that pulls you further away from what you plan to do, further away from your goals, further away from your values, further away from becoming the kind of person you want to become. So this isn't just semantics. This is really important because I would argue that any action can be traction or distraction based on one word. And that one word is forethought, right? That the time you plan to waste is not wasted time. So we need to stop moralizing and medicalizing perfectly normal behavior. If you want to watch videos on YouTube or you want to go on Discord or you want to go on, fa on Facebook, there's nothing wrong with that stuff. Somebody tell me why using technology, right? Why, why is using the internet somehow morally inferior to watching a football game on TV? <laughs> What's the difference? There's no difference, exactly. but no, you don't hear anybody saying, oh, football is hijacking your brain, right? There's no difference. <laughs> no, it's simply the fact that we do this stuff with intent. If you want to do it with forethought, enjoy. There's nothing wrong with it. If you plan the time to use social media or do whatever you want with your time, I don't care. My, my job is not to tell you what to do with your time. It's to help you do what you want to do with your time. So if you say, I want to play video games, great. If you decide when you're going to do that according to your values and your schedules, now it's traction. It's not distraction. Conversely, and this gets to your question, any action can be distraction if it's not what you plan to do with your time and attention. So, you know, in my case, for years, I would sit down on my desk at work and I would say, okay, now I'm going to get started. I'm going to get the, on that big task I've been meaning to do. I know I need to work on that big project. Nothing's going to distract me. Nothing's going to get in my way. Here I go. I'm going to get started. But first, let me check some email, right? And I justified this to myself thinking, oh, email is a productive thing to do, right? Email is, is, is a work-related task. I'm being productive, aren't I? Well, if it's not what I plan to do with my time, if it's not working on that big project that I said I was going to work on at that time and place in my day, just because it's a work-related task doesn't mean it's not a distraction. In fact, that is the worst kind of distraction because it's tricked you into prioritizing the easy and the urgent work at the expense of the hard and important work you have to do to move your life and career forward. So it's always these type of work tasks that we think are we're, we're being productive if we do that take us away from the really important work that we said we're going to do in advance. So just because it's, it's a work-related task doesn't mean it's not a distraction. That's the most terrible kind of distraction. So be very, very careful. If it's not what you plan to do with your time in advance, it is by definition a distraction. So anything you plan to do with your time and attention, as long as it's done with intent, with forethought, it's great. It's traction. Anything else is distraction. So you can't call something a distraction unless you know what it distracted you from. So I work with so many people who have told me, oh, you know, my, I, I, it's so hard to stay focused for some reason. You know, I must, I must have some kind of uh, pathology. I need to go to get a diagnosis you know, I, because my kids want this and my boss wants this and I can't fit against anything and I'm constantly scatterbrained all the time. And I say, well, let's start – with what's on your schedule. What did you plan to do with your time today? Oh, but look at my to-do list. I have 100 things on my to-do list. No, 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 that's not what we asked, right? <laughs> what's on your schedule? We can talk later about why to-do lists are one of the worst things you can do for your personal productivity. We can get back to that later. But what I oftentimes see is that people don't plan their time. And if you don't plan your time in this day and age, somebody's gonna plan it for you. So you can't call something a distraction unless you know what it distracted you from. If you look at your calendar and it's full of white space, right? You haven't planned your time. Everything is a freaking distraction <laughs> because what did you get distracted from? So that's why it's, it's absolutely critical. And what's really worked for me is this technique that's been validated in thousands of peer-reviewed studies. It's called time boxing, which is all about planning out what you're going to do and when you're going to do it. Even if it's, I want to play video games, even if it's, I want to go on social media, it's in my calendar. Now it's no longer a distraction. It's traction. Uh, and you describe the wavering away from these important tasks, these forethought tasks, as you, you just gave them by being catalyzed by internal triggers. Um, I, I've also heard you speak about, or re I've read that you have been kept up at night because of ruminating thoughts. Are these ruminating thoughts internal triggers, and what what's your four-step model to overcome and master your internal triggers? Yeah, so we talked about traction, we talked about distraction, now we have to ask ourselves, what prompts ourselves to these actions? So here we have our triggers. 
So the triggers that most people are familiar with are what we call external triggers, the pings, the dings, the rings, things in our outside environment that can prompt us towards traction or distraction. Now, studies find that even though this is what people blame distraction on, right? We blame our phones, we blame our kids, we blame our colleagues, we blame things outside ourselves. Studies find that this is the source of only 10% of our distractions, 10%. What's the other 90%? The other 90% of the time we get distracted, we get distracted by what we call internal triggers. Internal triggers are uncomfortable emotional states that we seek to escape from. Boredom, loneliness, fatigue, uncertainty, stress, anxiety. These are these uncomfortable emotional states that we seek to escape. So again, time management is pain management. 90% of the time that we go off track, whether it's eating something that we later regret if we're on a diet, whether it's using our time and attention in a way we later regret if we're trying to stay focused, whether it's spending money in a way that we later regret if we're on a budget, all of these distractions, 90% of the time, they're coming from these internal triggers. So we have to be very aware of that. So now we have this four-part model of step number one, master the internal triggers or they will become your master. Right? We have to find ways. We, have, we need tools in our toolkit ready to go so that when we feel these uncomfortable emotional states, we don't drink them away. We don't scroll them away. We don't click them away. We deal with them in a way that leads us towards traction rather than distraction. Okay, So that's step number one, master the internal triggers. Step number two, make time for traction. That if you don't plan your time, somebody's going to plan it for you. So this is what we talked about a little bit earlier around knowing what your day is going to look like, having some sort of a schedule so that you know what is the difference between traction and distraction for every minute of your day. Now, it sounds like a lot of work. It's actually not. Anybody can do it. It's very easy. We can talk about that in a minute. The third step is to hack back the external triggers. So even though they only account for about 10% of the time we get distracted, very easy tactical things we can do to hack back email, hack back those notifications, hack back social media. They don't have to just hack our brains. We can hack back. We are not powerless. There's a whole lot we can do. And in fact, I think we are way more powerful than any of these distractions. The fourth step is to prevent distraction with pacts. A pact is a pre-commitment. It's when we decide in advance what we are going to do to prevent ourselves from getting distracted. And here we've got all kinds of different pacts that we can use. We can dive into more detail here. But basically, we're erecting a firewall so that when we potentially get distracted, after we've implemented these three other steps first, mastering internal triggers, making time for traction, and hacking back the external triggers, as the last line of defense, we have this firewall against distraction called making a pact or a pre-commitment device. So it's really about using these four steps in concert. This is how we become indistractable. I absolutely love it, Nier. Let's talk about external triggers then. How optimal is this new corporate hybrid, you know, working from home model with Zoom meetings galore? Are these Zoom meetings adding to productivity? Are they efficient? And how do you have difficult conversations within work to prove that these Zoom meetings aren't as efficient as they might seem? Well, I, I don't know. I think there's, there's, you know, like everything, the question to ever sorry, the answer to every difficult question is always the same. There's only one answer to truly difficult questions, and the answer is it depends, <laughs> right? <laughs> if the answer was obvious, we, we wouldn't be asking it. So every difficult question, the answer is it depends, right? Is social media good for us? It depends. Is social media bad for us? It depends. Are Zoom meetings good for us? It depends. Are Zoom meetings bad for us? It depends. <laughs> so in many ways, they're great, right? Primarily when uh, we were in, all infecting each other with um, with a contagious virus that was potentially de- lethal, Zoom was freaking awesome. It was great <laughs> at doing what it did and letting us communicate. I mean, look, you're, you're in Scotland, right? Yeah, I'm in Singapore where I don't know how many thousands, tens of thousands of kilometers away from each other. And here we are talking to each other, uh, you know, synchronously for free. <laughs> I mean, that's amazing, right? But there's no way we could have this conversation without these amazing technologies. So in many ways, they're, they're amazing. They're fantastic. Uh, but, you know, as, as Sophocles said, the Greek philosopher, nothing vast enters the life of mortals without a curse. So, of course, something as vast as the internet is going to come with certain curses. And one of the curses of this amazing technology is that it's become so easy to call meetings because we don't have to be in the same geographic location anymore. We can call meetings whenever we want with whoever we want, and we can meet with them instantly at a touch of a button. Because it's become so easy to call meetings, right, the first rule of interaction design is the easier something is, the more people will do it. So the easier it became to call meetings, the more meetings people call. And that means that we have a lot of stupid meetings. 
that didn't need to be called. So that's the real downside of, of how easy it's become to meet with each other is that you can, you can just send someone a Zoom invite uh, if you see that their calendar is clear in your organization. You know, many people give calendar access within their organization, and you're letting people just run your day for you by saying, okay, you're going to be in this meeting, you're going to be in that meeting. Well, when the heck am I going to work? <laughs> when am I going to have my, my time for focused work? Uh, and so one of the, there's a few things we can do to, to try and claw back the time that uh, these, these very distracting meetings um, uh, take away from us. And one, one of them is very, very simple. It's something that we learn in high school. You know, if you were ever on student council, the first rule is that you can't call a meeting unless you have an agenda. Well, studies find that 80% of meetings that are called in corporate environments don't have a pre-circulated agenda. WTF. <laughs> what I really are we thinking? 80% of meetings don't have an agenda. I actually think it's higher than that. It's ridiculous, right? Why, if, if you don't, and, and why, why do I advocate for this? It sounds you know, like, like kindergarten stuff, and it is. The reason I advocate for this, no, no meeting, no, I'm sorry, no agenda, no meeting, is that it adds a bit of friction, right? I want the person who's calling the meeting to take a few minutes and make sure this meeting is really necessary. So I want to make it a bit more difficult. I'll meet with you, right? Here's my calendar. You can find time at this, you know, by the way, block off that time, back to that rule around time blocking, block off the time that's available for people to book meetings with you. Don't make it your entire day. But I think it's perfectly reasonable to say, hey, from this time to this time, that's my time available for meetings. If you want to book one, feel free, but you need to circulate an agenda at least 24 hours before, right? Ideally, you can't book the meeting unless you, you send the agenda beforehand. So that's a very simple thing that you can do within your organization. Super simple to do if you're in a management position, right? No excuse not to do this. But even if you're not in a management position, it can be a cultural norm. You know, don't be the bad guy. Make me the bad guy, right? Say, hey, you read this book and it made you so productive. Hey, boss, you should read it too. They'll get the hint. The second thing you can do, and this is something I, I learned from Amazon, is that you require the person organizing the meeting to circulate a, uh, a, a, a summary document, right? A, a preparation document. A preparation document is where the person who's calling the meeting, the stakeholder, who is going to take up everybody's time to call this meeting, is going to have done the homework and circulated what they have learned so that they can accomplish the goal of the meeting. What is the goal of meetings? Okay, the goal of a meeting, it's not what most people think. Most people think, oh, it's for brainstorming, it's for socializing, no. Okay, socializing is for socializing, right? You want to grab a, a, a beer with your mates after work? Wonderful, do that. That is not a business meeting. That's a social engagement. Brainstorming, do not brainstorm in meetings. We know that brainstorming, research, research has found, is terrible in groups of two or more. Okay, so, I'm sorry, uh, three or more. So, so the, the optimal size for a brainstorming meeting is one person, maximum two people. Anything more than two people is a, is a waste of time because in, in brainstorming meetings where people where there's more than, than two people, the loudest, most dominant, highest paid, and most male person dominates a conversation. So it a, it's a, turns out to be a waste of time. Brainstorming is best done on your own or with one other person. And then you type up your wonderful thoughts and you send them to the stakeholder so that they can, they can um, digest your thoughts and bring them to the meeting because the point of the meeting, okay, here's the thing to remember, the point of a business meeting is to gain consensus, to gain consensus. If we are going to call a meeting, the point of the meeting is one thing, to gain consensus, which means that the person calling the damn meeting needs to do their homework in order to persuade us around what the course of action should be. What most people do when they call meetings is they lazy out. They don't want to do their homework. So they say, hey, let's get, to, get together to just to talk this out. No, do your freaking homework come up with an action plan, and then get our consensus around it. And if we disagree, we will voice those concerns to change the course of action. That's the point of the meeting. If you do those two things, okay, require an agenda, no agenda, no meeting, and require a, a, a summary document in that meeting so that the person does the homework, this will nearly eliminate all of these pointless, distracting meetings that we experience today, with or without Zoom. Nir, I think that's my trailer clip sorted. That's a mic drop moment from you. I mm -hmm. have noticed that within my own behavior that I focus on optics rather than outcomes. I want to show face with my bosses. I want to show face within management because it makes me more, um, it kind of strengthens an inner belief that um, if I have greater visibility, I have greater success within an organization. But that is not the case. And those two lessons really brought that to life near. So thank you for that. 
Absolutely. And by the way, you can still show what a great contribution uh, you make to the company, not in the live meeting, right? You can do your homework beforehand, write it up. And this is why I'm such an advocate of, of the power of the written word, right? I think if there's one skill uh, that, that, that will serve you most in your career, no matter what profession you're in, is the ability uh, to, to use the written word to convey a message. So you can do that beforehand. The problem is how much of our time in a meeting is spent uh, in, in, in you know, talking about stuff that could have been an email. Right? It doesn't need to be synchronous. You can write up your thoughts. People can read it at their own leisure. They don't need you to sit there and convey an idea that would have been much better expressed uh, if it was written out. 100%. So we spoke about how the knowledge worker can design their day to be more efficient and we spoke about how we can have those kind of difficult conversations the premise of that is to just blame Nier and his books but broader than that <laughs> in our personal lives how can we hack back external triggers for um focus and productivity yeah so it's really about which external triggers are taking you off track so again the 90 percent of the of the distractions will be caused by internal triggers so i don't want to minimize that that is much more important than the external triggers Right, figuring out what are you going to do when you feel bored? What are you going to do when you feel lonely? What are you going to, are you going to do when you feel uncertain, stressed, anxious? That's ninety percent of the reason of our distraction uh, that that we get distracted. But these external triggers still account for about ten percent of our distractions, and they're they're pretty easy to take care of, right? So your phone, okay? Uh, do we really need a book to tell us to change our notification settings? No, I mean I, I devote <laughs> almost no time to it. But the point of the matter is that two thirds of people with a smartphone never change their notification settings what? <laughs> like, seriously, are we going to complain that technology is addicting us and hijacking our brains when we haven't turned off those goddamn notification settings? It takes seconds. The phone manufacturers make it so easy. Don't let the, the apps that distract you keep distracting you, right? One of my favorite quotes is from Poela Coelho, who said, a mistake repeated more than once is a decision. A mistake repeated more than once is a decision. If you get distracted by something once, Okay, it happens, right? Even I get distracted by, by novel distractions, novel stimuli from time to time. It happens, right? All of us get distracted. An indistractable person is not someone who never gets distracted. It's someone who says, okay, I understand why I got distracted and I will do something about it as opposed to an, a distractible person keeps getting distracted by the same things again and again and again and they don't do anything about it. They are choosing to be distracted. So if you keep getting distracted by your goddamn phone, you're making a choice to be distracted because it takes five seconds to turn off the notification <laughs> settings, right? It's not that hard. That's kindergarten stuff, right? That, that's, that's stupid. You don't need to buy my book to tell you that. It, it's not even prominent in the book. What I think is a bigger source of distraction that we don't talk about are things like meetings. You know, now we talked about some solutions. We just talked about that. Uh, emails. Emails are the bane of the modern worker's existence, right? We spend so much time uh, uh, on email. And most of that email, a Harvard Business Review study found that 25% of the emails that we get, we did not need to get in a corporate environment. And 25% of the emails we send, we did not need to send. So it's a huge time sink, a huge distraction. Uh, kids, right? Many of us are working from home now. We love our kids to death, but they can be a huge source of distraction. What do you do when they're a source of external triggers? So there's all kinds of other people, right? As we go back into, into the office, uh, what do we do when your coworker stops by the, your desk and says, hey, I got to tell you this piece of office gossip? That can also be a distraction. So the idea is that we want to systematically hack back each and every one of those distractions. And there's something that you can do for each and every one of those. For example, I'll just give you one quick one. Um, when, uh, when we go back to work, you know, many of us are now going back to the office environment. So in every copy of my book, Indistractable, there is a piece of cardstock that you pull out of the book, you fold it into thirds, and you put it on your computer monitor. It's a red sign that says, I'm indistractable, please come back later. And the idea here is to interrupt the interruption so that when someone comes by your desk, and I'm not saying put this on your desk all day, but for when you need to do that focused work time, when you need that hour, hour and a half, two hours of time I need to work without distraction, there's nothing wrong with putting up a little sign that says, come back a little later because I'm indistractable at the moment. And this is the kind of stuff we have to do. We have to change our culture to allow us to do our best work without distraction. Right? And that's not going to happen by itself. We have to be brave, stand up. Yeah, it's going to be a little uncomfortable. Okay, yeah, it's going to be a little weird. But is it any more weird and uncomfortable than someone who has an unusual diet? Do we say, oh, you shouldn't be vegetarian because people might think poorly of you? Oh, you shouldn't wear a hijab or other religious garb because it might be unusual? No, if it's one of your values, 
to be indistractable, just like it might be your values to not eat meat or to uh, pray to a particular God. If that's your values, live out your values, right? Don't be embarrassed. And this is how we're going to change the world. This is how we're going to change society by inoculating people with these social antibodies. When we learn, hey, life is better when we can work without distraction. And it's a much more nuanced, much smarter approach than technology bad. The tech companies are trying to manipulate you and hijack your brain. That's BS, right? We can do something about this. But the problem is everybody wants to blame it on somebody else. Nobody wants to take action for it themselves. The people who will get ahead, the high performers in the world, they're the ones who are going to do something about it right now. Nir, say I have mastered the internal triggers, hack back my external triggers, and I want to put the cherry on top of the cake, which is to prevent distraction with packs. Where do I begin with that? Yeah, so preventing distraction with packs is what we do last. It's after we use the other three techniques of mastering internal triggers, making time for traction, hacking back at the external triggers. And here we have a few different types of packs. Packs are these pre-commitments, these things we decide in advance that help us stay on track. So there's three types of packs. There's what we call price packs is when we have some kind of monetary disincentive to not get distracted. We have what we call an effort pact where we have some kind of uh, friction, some kind of effort that comes between us and the thing we don't want to do. And then we have what we call an identity pact where we have some kind of moniker that we call ourselves that helps us uh, 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 stay on track. And so uh, we can use these three different packs whenever we need them. So I'll, I'll give you one example. Uh, a few years ago, I, I, I noticed that my wife and I we're going to bed later and later. And so we weren't getting enough sleep. Our sex life was suffering because every night I was scrolling my iPhone and she was caressing her iPad and we weren't being intimate. So I was doing this research, writing this book, Indistractable, and I came across this, this uh, idea of an effort pact. And the idea is to put some effort in between you and the distraction. So in my household, every night, the internet shuts off at 10 p.m. Every night, the internet shuts off automatically. Now, could I turn it back on? Could I find a way to get back online? Of course I could. But knowing that that's going to happen every single night, now I have to rush to, 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 to get offline to finish everything I need to do because I know the internet's going to turn off, right? And turning it back on would take effort. I'd have to figure out how to you know, switch around the router and turn it back on and take a lot of work. So that is a, is a pact I made with myself, and it's, it's changed our lives. It's benefited my daughter. It's benefited my wife. It's benefited my sex life. Because now we, we get to bed on time, uh, and after, what, 20 years of marriage, we just celebrated our 20-year anniversary, it's worked very well. So highly recommend it. Congratulations on your anniversary. That's amazing <laughs> to hear. Have you heard of the 75 hard phenomenon, the fitness challenge? No, what's that? So my, my friend and I created a pact to basically get in shape for the first 75 days of um, 2022, and essentially it's 75 days of no alcohol, no cheap meals, two workouts a day, meditation and reading and the wow. the clause of it all is that if you miss one day you start from the beginning again and I did this with my Ooh. best mate and the results were incredible and I believe it was that effort that effort packed of knowing that if I were to fail and give up one day I would have to start again and boy did that drive me throughout the entire the entirety of the 75 days near Wow, incredible. So that kind of pact utilizes a few different packs. One, there's that the, the, there's the social pact you made with your, your mate that you said, hey, this is something I'm going to do. You also had this effort pact that if you didn't do it, you had this, this, this punishment of more effort that would come later on. It's almost like a price and effort pact there. Uh, that's interesting. Now, the one disclaimer I have to tell your audience that that type of pact can, can be dangerous. The, the results can be incredible, right? But... They can also be dangerous because if you do something like that without first doing the other three steps, if you don't deal with the internal triggers, if you don't schedule the time, right? It's going to be very unrealistic for a, a new parent to work out twice a day, meditate, read, and do everything you did. It, the time has to be scheduled in your day. It has to be you know, on your schedule or it's not going to happen. Removing the external triggers, right? You have to do those three steps first to set yourself up to, for success because the likelihood of you falling off the wagon are very high. And if you fall another day and another day, another day, eventually say, ah, screw it. And many people can fall hard. They can think that there's something wrong with them. That they're somehow deficient. That they're no good. That they're a failure, and that can set them back. So one, make sure you do those other three steps first, and two, make sure you give yourself self-compassion. That we find that a, a defining criteria of people who do meet their long-term goals are people who who can talk to themselves the way they could talk to a good friend. 
a, 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 the kind of person who gives themselves self-compassion when they do fail. I love it. S- say a listener has followed our journey across the last four steps and is still within the decision of remaining true to their to-do list. They think, no, those four won't work for me. I'm going to mm-hmm. lean on my trusty to-do list. What kind yeah. of allergic reaction would you give them? Yeah, all right. So so let's talk about why uh, to-do lists are one of the worst things you can do for your personal productivity. And by the way, I used to be a to-do list devotee. And I'll tell you what I've learned from the psychology of distraction. This isn't just me. There's a lot of research around this. So the number one worst thing about to-do lists is that they don't have any uh, – they, they are not finite, right? That you can, you can add more to a to-do list forever and ever. Okay, and just to be clear, by the way, I'm not against writing things down. Okay, that's very good. Getting things out of your brain, putting them in an app, putting them on a piece of paper, wonderful. It's if that's all you do, that's a problem. Because if you look at your to-do list to tell you what to do with your time and not your calendar, you're making a huge mistake. So what you should be doing is to take that that to-do list that you wrote down and put it in a particular time when you will do each and every task. Because unlike a to-do list, which has no constraints, a calendar comes with 24 hours in the day, right? You have only have 24 hours a day, so you have to make trade-offs. And that's why with a to-do list, it's, it's so harmful because what happens with a to-do list, people who just run their life on a to-do list, they come home at the, from work at the end of the day, and they look at this list of a 1,000 things that they still haven't done, and day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year, they are reminded that they are someone who does not do what they say they're going to do. Loser. And that begins to take a psychic toll. You begin to believe, oh, I'm no good at time management, right? You be this rubbish. It's not true. It's a stupid technique that's broken. You're not broken. It's the technique that's broken. So if you're not putting these tasks on your calendar, you're making a, a big mistake. Another reason that it's so harmful to, to just use a to-do list is that almost nobody these days has experienced what true leisure feels like. Because with a to-do list, I call this the tyranny of the to-do list, right? I would come home. All I want to do is play with my daughter or watch something on Netflix or just relax, but I can't relax because I'm constantly thinking about all the things that I haven't done on my to-do list, right? You don't actually get to relax. You're always thinking about, I could be doing more, I could be doing more because there's still all this undone stuff on my to-do list. As opposed to someone who's indistractable, someone who time boxes their day, time with my daughter is on my schedule, time to watch TV is on my schedule, right? There's nothing else I should be doing. That now is traction, So it's only when you say to yourself, oh, this is exactly what I'm supposed to be doing right now. I can actually relax as opposed to people who are devoted to do lists. They're constantly thinking about all the things they still have left undone. It's just a much better psychological place to be, to be in that place of ease, to really enjoy leisure. And that only comes from knowing that you're doing exactly what you said you're going to do with your time and your attention. I've drawn such great inspiration from your work over the podcast that I've listened to. And I took time box my day. I allocate actionable and non-actionable thoughts to uh, a list and then I pull the actionable list into my time box Um, but what can we do what's the importance of noting down non-actionable thoughts for example my car needs serviced in 11 months that's a ruminating thought that you have or oh my dad's birthday's in four months time I might host a birthday party for him but they're not micro tasks that you can allocate to that specific date how important is externalizing non-actionable thoughts I think it's a great idea. So getting that out of your brain and putting that somewhere is a wonderful idea. So that's a great way to use a to-do list. To say, uh, you know, my car needs to be serviced in 11 months, that would be a great thing to put in a to-do list app or in your to-do list calendar, you know, if you use a, a, a paper version of a to-do list, so that in nine months from now, it'll remind you. I mean, that 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 is actually putting it on your calendar, right? It's it's almost the same as time boxing. You know, what I do is I have a a, a section in my day called admin, and that admin is only 30 minutes, but it's all these loose ends, right? It's on this day, don't forget to get a Mother's Day present because it's going to come up in five days from now. Or don't you know? Don't forget to make an appointment with the mechanic to service the car. So I put that time, all these little it's, itsy bitsy tasks, they're on my calendar. And so I have time in my day. I don't have to slip it in in between stuff. I know I won't forget it because my schedule says at 8 o'clock to 8.30, look over my admin duties and make sure there's nothing coming up that I have to do right now. And if I do have to do something, so it says, oh, make sure I book time to, uh, to, to make a car appointment, hey, guess what I do? I go to that part in my, in my day uh, and I put it in for you know three days from now, four days from now when I know it's going to happen. What you don't want to do is to change the calendar in the day. Okay, once you set that schedule for the day, you don't change it. <laughs> but you're absolutely free to change 
tomorrow, the next day, the next month, the next year. You can change the schedule for the days coming up. It's not that you – I think a lot of people misinterpret this and say, oh, you have to lock in your calendar for the rest of your life. No, no, no. You, you can change it day to day. You just don't want to change it in the day. Once you wake up in the morning and say, this is what I'm going to do for the day and this is what you know, this is going to be set in stone, you got to s- stick to it for the day. I love it, Nier. I want to talk about personal relationships and how time boxing your day can improve them. I receive pushback from some, I want to call them kind of more hippie friends, more loose friends who don't use a calendar, don't use a to-do list. I, I, I've often, for example, I've said to them, on Saturday, I'm going to pencil and play guitar between 4 and 5 p.m. And they say to me, WTF, David, who pencils and playing the guitar? You just pick it up and play it. You shouldn't have to time box that. How can I sell the benefits of productivity or time boxing my day or being indistractable how can i sell the benefits to intimate relationships and friendships in the same way without them having this kind of robotic visceral reaction i don't think it's your job to sell it i think the way you sell it is you you show them how well you play guitar (laughs) and they say wow david when did you have time to learn how to play guitar so well well, I practiced on Sunday from four to five o'clock <laughs> every day, every week for a year, <laughs> and and they'll be and they'll you know their their jaw will hit the floor because they can't play the, the the guitar as well as you can because they left it as an aspiration, as a dream, as something maybe they'll do someday. And this is what I'm on a mission to fix. I want people to live out their dreams, to live out their aspirations, to do what they themselves want to do. But if we just leave it loosey goosey, if we just think, oh, okay, I'll get to it someday. It just remains a dream. How many amazing authors don't share the work that's in their uh, that's in them because they don't make the time to write? How many musicians we'll never know about because they don't make the time to play? How many relationships could we have in our life because we don't plan the time to be with the most important people in our life? Uh, so if, if if your life is hunky dory and and you're getting everything you want out of your life and you're accomplishing your dreams, hey, don't buy my book or anybody else's dream. You should write or anybody else's book. You should be writing a book to teach <laughs> the rest of us. But if you're finding that hey, I, I I'm not doing what I know I'm capable of. I'm not living the kind of life I know I deserve. Well, this is why. Oh, I love that advice. That will be something I hold on to dearly for the rest of my life. I recently enjoyed one of your articles called "Why Do People Go to Bars." And it notes that you've been sober for a few years now. What does yeah. sobriety, going to bars, and distraction um, have in common? Yeah, so I haven't uh, drank for almost two and a half years now. Congratulations. And uh, yeah, you know, I, I, I felt at one point that I was just getting tricked, <laughs> right? Like that it wasn't, I, you know... It, it, there's, I think it's another one of these things that um, you kind of just unplug from the matrix and you realize that there's a, a big business devoted to getting you to believe that to be happy, you must drink. And, and, and the reason that's the case is because so many things suck if you're sober. <laughs> right? Like when I decided to give up drinking and then I went to, uh, you know, to a club or to a bar most of them are really boring, right? Like you can, and they're designed to be boring. The music is cranked up super loud, so you can't have a conversation, right? It's dark, so that you can't really make out what people's, you know, what what, what people's uh, people are saying when their lips move. Like they're they are designed to get you to drink more and more and more. Uh, and somehow in society, we think that like that's just what you have to do, right? Like if you sit down and you're with people, you gotta have a drink in your hand. Well, I I, I think it's a trick. <laughs> <laughs> like I really think it's a trick. We know it's poison, right? Uh, the, the, we we know that the uh, uh, the World Health Organization has told us now that there is no safe dose of alcohol. Uh, so that's a fact, right? Like it is a carcinogen. Like if, it's amazing to me that people worry about organic strawberries and apples. <laughs> Meanwhile, they're they're <laughs> sloshing down a known carcinogen uh, that that you know it, it is. It, people listen. It causes cancer. Like we know this. This is not disputable. Well, nothing. You know, nothing in science. Is, is is for sure forever but everything we know today about the science of alcohol tells us that there is no safe amount uh and so i didn't need it anymore and uh i think it's a very good test to see what you actually enjoy what i thought was fun like going to bars i thought was fun and then i did the sobriety uh test to see hey is it fun if i'm sober 
And if something is not fun when you're sober, it means it's not really fun. It means you're doing it as an escape from reality, which is fine, by the way. I don't think there's anything wrong with wanting to escape reality. I mean, you can escape reality when you read a great book. You can escape reality when you watch a movie. You can escape reality when you play a video game. But we should be honest with ourselves. Right? We should be honest with ourselves that that is why we're doing it. And as long as that's what we want to do with our time and attention uh, and is it consistent with our values, there's nothing wrong with that. I just found that at, at this point in my life, it wasn't consistent with my values anymore. Well, Nir, congrats on your uh, sobriety anniversary. So congrats on your uh, anniversary with your wife. This has been a really full circle moment for me. I've enjoyed so many episodes that you've been a guest on. I've got your book on Kindle. I'm gutted that I didn't get the paper copy, so I didn't have the the indistractable card that came along with it, but I'm going to purchase it. This has been such a full circle moment for me. Thank you so much, Nir. If the people want to get in touch with you or find your book, where can they reach out? Sure. Thank you, David. I appreciate you having me so much. And uh, you can go to my blog, nearandfar.com. Nir is spelled like my first name. So that's N-I-R and far. So nearandfar.com. And if you go to indistractable.com, that's spelled I-N, the word distract. A-B-L-E, so indistractable.com. There's actually a free 80-page workbook that you can get there that's completely complimentary that will start you on your journey to becoming indistractable. And again, that's totally free. Nir, thank you for stopping by. I'll share all the links in the show notes. It was a pleasure. Thanks for coming on the Development by David podcast, my friend. Thanks so much, David. Appreciate it. (laughs) 